ladies and gentlemen. I'm pleased to welcome you to this session on catalyst deactivation, or in other words, the mortality and morbidity of catalysts. And uh, we welcome all the members of the Lucretia Borgia Club here, and uh, those uh, who have, uh, uh, that, that means for those who have taken uh, my deactivation course or the one by Button Weekman. We uh, are pleased to have a, a nice audience this morning, so early in the morning, and uh, we're very pleased to have Dr. Shen, Shen Feng, who will be our uh, first speaker and our keynote uh, speaker. Uh, Dr. Feng received his Bachelor's of Science in Chemical <coughs> Engineering from Berkeley and his MS and PhD in Chemical Engineering from the University of Illinois. His research interests include catalyst preparation, characterization, uh, also uh, deactivation and regeneration. And his most significant discoveries include strong metal support interactions, or SMSI, uh, methanol uh, fuel cell catalysts, and new regeneration redispersion technologies for platinum iridium and platinum zeolite catalysts. He has 37 patents and 32 publications. And he's going to talk to us uh, a, about a new experimental technique. Dr. Fong. Thank you. I want to thank, uh, thank the uh, conference uh, organizer for inviting me to give this talk. And I want to acknowledge my co-author, especially, especially <coughs> Ki Lu. Uh, he's doing a thesis work with me. And uh, Professor Carl Por Carlos Porini, he worked with me uh, in, the catalyst, in the area of catalyst deactivation in normal heptane reforming. In the past several years, <coughs> we have developed methods to identify reaction components leading to coke and a reaction network to account for observed product profile along the catalyst path. <coughs> With the development of a customized flow through vibrating microbalance, we have defined coking kinetics in normal heptane reforming. We have devised a new detection method for Temperature programmed coke oxidation. This allows us to obtain coking kinetics parameters and use it for catalyst regeneration. Now, however, catalyst cat activity loss due to metal agglomeration cannot be recovered uh, just by simple coke burning. Uh, we address this problem successfully by defining the, the redispersion chemistry specifically for individual catalyst system. Due to time limitation, uh, today I will just focus on three areas. First one is we will identify the reaction components. Uh, from there it may coke. And the second one is we will define the deactivation function and see what is this function related to the active site. The third one will propose a uh, cooking mechanism to uh, account for the observed cooking kinetics. Now, what we have done is we have uh, a reactor that we use to identify the uh, 
uh, what, what kind of reaction product is forming the code. This is a multi-outlet reactor. We have uh, a reactor that has outlet from the wall, outlet one, two, three, and four. Now at the four outlet, the reactor will see all the catalysts. At the one, it will be like a few percent of the catalyst. All this tube leading to a wow, this is a, a uh, I call it a stream selection wow, with one single outlet connected to a TC sampling wow. And this wow will rotate and control which stream will go into the TC. And all this is done automatically, so you can get a uh, sample to the TC uh, in rotation. With that, we can look at the product profile and also at the end of the run, we can load the reactor and the catalyst will be in section, they won't mix up and you will see, uh, you can determine the code profile along the reactor. Here is the uh, code profile for these two catalysts. One is palmarinium catalyst, the other one is palm on alumina. Uh, both run at uh, 213 hours and 215 hours at the about the same time. So at the end of the uh, run, we discharge the catalyst, and here the code profile for palmarinium catalyst. It's decreasing along the bed. For platinum on alumina, it's, in, it's exhibit a maximum. So one is lower than two and then decreasing down here. Now if we look at the product profile, we don't see any product will match this profile except for C5 ring net fins. If we take the C5 ring net fins average, it, average concentration uh, for the whole time period, we can see if we plot coke versus C5 net fin for palmarinium, and we can see a correlation. When you have high coke, you have high C5 nephine. This one corresponds to this one. And four, when you have low coke, you have low C5 nephine, and you get a linear correlation if you plot coke versus this. Now for platinum, also, even if it exhibit a maximum here, that means your uh, C5 nephine concentration profile also exhibit a maximum, so you get a linear relationship. And here, we are showing a, a time uh, on stream C7 concentration profile along section 1, 2, 3, and 4. And from this concentration profile, we can estimate a deactivation constant for each section. And it is shown in the next one. And that is the KD. And you can see KD following the same profile as the Coke profile. And also the C5 ring naphene profile. So what it says is C5 ring naphene is the major Coke precursor for uh, forming Coke. And if you have more Coke, your deactivation constant will be higher. Now, once we define what reaction intermediate to form coke, we have to find out coke and kinetic. Uh, the best way to do coke and kinetic is microbalance. <coughs> but in the conventional microbalance, there's some problem. You have very severe fit gas uh, bypassing, so you cannot determine the uh, space velocity, the true base, space velocity inside the catalyst bed. Okay, now why should you need the space velocity? Because if you don't know the actual concentration inside the catalyst bed, and that will influence the coking rate, because the coking rate is depending on whatever intermediate concentration in, in, your, in your catalyst. Uh, same principle apply, I mean your Reaction kinetic cannot be uh, estimated accurately because you don't know the exact uh, space velocity inside your bed. Now, 
when we are looking around for a balance that can uh, give us uh, the, to, to negate this, uh, this problem, we found out that RMP company has a vibrational microbalance. Usually they use it for uh, room temperature application, looking at collection of dust or measuring particulate in air or in the coal mine. So it's a room temperature application for gathering solid particles. And we want, we talk to them and use it to apply for high temperature, high pressure, flow through, and put cans into a, uh, a uh, basket, not basket, into a cell at the end of the vibration element. This will allow us to continue monitor the cooking rate without uh, feed gas bypassing. Here is the simple flow, flow, uh, flow diagram of the balance. The main part of the balance is this taper element, and it's made of high temperature glass, special high temperature glass. And at the tip, you have a we have a cell, and you can pack the cells in here, and you can have a, a cap to cap the uh, end of the uh, the uh, cell so the cells will not fall out. Now. In between the catalysts, you have to pack, pack uh, coarse wool in there so to hold the catalyst in place. The, you can have gas flowing through this taper element and directly into the catalyst bed and come out. Now, because this element has to vibrate freely, and so this gap, you have to have gap in here. And so you need a purge gas. If you don't have purge gas, your reaction gas will come back in here. So you need inner purge gas to swap the reactant out to go to the TC for TC analysis. Now, the major part of this thing is also a optical uh, uh, sense, uh, or you send a light, and then this is the detector. This is a feedback mechanism to measure the frequency change of this taper element. Now in here, this is the classical uh, gravimetric uh, balance. Here's the vibrating balance that we expand this part. And the classical balance, you have a lot of bypassing. But, but the main problem is you don't know exactly how much you have feed gap bypassing. In here, well, I want to show you the uh, sensitivity of the balance, and here is, we have the helium flowing inside the uh, balance, the taper element. At a certain time, we switch helium to nitrogen, and you can see the weight increase. And then here we switch back to helium, and switch back to nitrogen. So you can see, just changing the gas inside the balance, you will see a change in weight due to the density difference between helium and nitrogen. Here is the principal operation principle of the balance. This is a cantilever beam mass spring system, and the weight change is uh, manufactured in frequency change. Okay. Now, this is the spring constant of the balance. So you have to determine the spring constant. What we do is we have, remember I said we have a cap on the uh, tip of the balance. Now you can put the cap in or, or first measure the balance frequency without the cap and then put the cap in, you measure another frequency and you know the weight of the cap so you can determine the K. Once you can determine the K, then you can calculate the effective volume of the balance by doing a gas switching from nitrogen to helium by this formula. And here's the molecular weight of the uh, individual gas. And we have done that by, we have two uh, paper elements. One, one can hold one gram of catalyst, the other one can hold one gram of catalyst. And without putting anything in there, we use a helium nitrogen switching. We can determine the effective volume of this and for this balance. 
Now, if you put a 0.17 gram of quartz, non-porous material in there, with the volume decreased to 0.36, that means the actual solid volume will be 0.11 cc. Also, we have test the balance, the kinetic um, data obtained from the balance compared with a fixed bed reactor. And the field circle and diamond and all those things are from the balance. The open one are from the uh, fixed bed reactor. And you can see, looking at the normal heptane concentration varying with time, uh, they are very close. And for the Taiyuan, down here, and C1 here, we haven't plotted the C1 for the bottom. And here's the cooking curve for the, for the uh, catalyst using this bottom. Now, as I say before, you have to know exactly what the uh, space velocity is inside the balance before you get uh, good cooking data because, as I saw here, when we vary the space velocity of the heptane from 28 to 40 to 80, you can see the cooking rate change. Okay, this is because you have different concentration in your balance. And everything is the same, just like we are keeping the hydrogen to normal heptane ratio at 3.0. Okay, now, since we know that the uh, C5 ring net field is the major cook precursor, we also want to look at other things, looking at the cooking rate, like putting Taiyuan in, Taiyuan really, cooking rate is very low, 100%, I mean, concentration wise, you don't dilute the Taiyuan, and you get this cooking rate. Now, for normal heptane, it's the square, you get the, this curve. And for MCP, ECP, it's a high, very high cooking rate. And if you put, dilute the MCP with uh, Taiyuan, and you cut down the cooking rate, you don't increase it because uh, in the literature, some people are speculating the coke can be come from Taiyuan and MCP reaction. And according to this figure here, Taiyuan is not reacting with the MCP to produce more coke. It really is just acting as an inner diluent. And when you put a 4% ECP or MCP into Taiyuan, uh, we see this curve here. Now, when you put, when you're looking at pure NC7, the outlet concentration uh, in MCP it is around uh, 4% MCP. So really, the major controlling factor is the MCP to give you the code. Now, from the uh, balance weight curve, in order to fit this Coke versus time data, this expression is the best to fit it. If this is the expression, then you will have a deactivation function in this form. This is the equation. The cooking rate will be a initial rate times a deactivation function. Okay. So now, the question is, what is the alpha, uh, and, what, what, uh, and why we have a form like this? And how is this related to the active site? And in this slide, I just show a simple picture. We have a callus particle here, we have active site, and part of the active site is covered by code. And this fraction of active site is not. S0 is the total active site. Okay. Now, if we write an equation like the loss of active site with time, of course, it's proportional to the cooking rate at that time period. But not, not all the coke would just deposit into active site. There is a random distribution between the site that already have coke in it. So you have to put a uh, weighting factor that 
this is the fraction of sites that have not been covered by code. And then this beta is how many code molecules will be active in one site. And when you do that, you integrate it, you get this expression, and you'll get S0, and this is the directory function, and you get this. So the active site will be initial active site times a deactivation function, just like the previous expression I showed you. So here's the expression we get. And alpha is equal to beta over S0. This is temperature independent. Okay. And what we found is, if we use this expression, the alpha we, we get out from all the curves are very close. And if you use other expression, the alpha vary. So once we fix the deact deactivation function form, we want to look at the deactivate kinetic. What is the response of the deactivate uh, cooking rate with the uh, concentration of MCP. And here are the variation in uh, partial pressure of MCP, here's the cooking rate. With this data, we can find a R0 dependence on the MCP partial pressure. And this, this is it. We plot the partial pressure of MCP versus R0 and this is a linear relationship. In the same manner, we keep the MCP partial pressure the same very the hydrogen partial pressure, and we can obtain the curve like this. And when you plot R0 versus partial pressure of hydrogen, it will be inverse proportional to it and with a second order. Now, what kind of reaction mechanism will give you this form? And here I show you the reaction mechanism. What it says is, we start, if you start with normal heptane, the, you produce MCP intermediate, and MCP intermediate get dehydrogenated on the metal site. And they are, the rate is very fast in, in, in equilibrium form. And this Coke precursor, since we haven't fixed the N here, so we, we just put a PC in here. This Coke precursor will go to the acid site, and get uh, and take part into polymerization. And we think the initiation step on the acid side is the rate determining step. So for this, we can write a equilibrium expression like that. And then the rate of cocaine will be R0. R0 is, is the initial rate. It's equal to this rate constant times the concentration of this. And if you put it back in here, you get this expression. And here's the deactivation function we already found, and the N have been determined to be two. That means this will be dehydrogenated to thiones. Uh, with that model, we can fit the experimental data for NC7 fit, and the solid line are the model. The Circles are the experimental value for 50% MCP plus thiamine or ECP fit. So they are pretty good fit using the model. So here's the here's the conclusion. So in uh, normal pain reforming, uh, we have determined the C5 ring thiones are the Koch precursor and come from the C5 ring methines. And this is suggested by the uh, Koch profile and time on stream uh, profile of the, of the deactivation function and also by supported by Koch <laughs> kinetic. And we have demonstrated that the bovo micro balance really can give you uh, good accurate cooking data and kinetic data and we have proposed a cooking mechanism. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you for a very interesting presentation. The paper is now open for discussion. We will ask uh, 
those in, from the audience who ask questions to come to the microphone and identify themselves. Please. My name is Mike Gerges. I work for Mobile. Um, I have a question regarding your microbalance reactor. Yeah. Are you operating as an integral reactor or as a CSDR? Uh, you can operate in both cases. You can have high space velocity or has differential reactor or has an uh, uh, integral reactor where you run low space velocity. Um, in your model, yes. I see that you consider the whole surface, yes. uh, but only the the part of the, the catalyst surface is not covered, is the one that causes deactivation in the coking rate. But you also consider that coke can go to regions that are already coke. Yes, we have, that's what the model is. So here's, you have coked and uncoked. When the next coke coming down, it doesn't mean it will just go to here. It is randomly distributed. So it, some will come in here, just like in here. You can see this three part is coked. And then you put another coke molecule in, this side is covered, but the other area is coke on coke. That's why you get this expression. Okay, but uh, what I understand from your mechanism, the coking, will start in the metal, so the dehydrogenate there? No, that is not coke. You dehydrogenate, and then that material is still a dye-in of the ring compound, and then dye-in will go to that acid site, initiate a polymerization process, and that initiation step is the rate controlling step. I will stay there, or will cover the metal? Also? It will cover mostly the acid site, or it migrate to metal site also, we don't know. I had a question there. Yes. I wondered if uh, if you form a uh, coke precursor, uh, would it be more likely to absorb on the monolayer, on the uh, uh, metal or, or uh, acid site surface, rather than on top of another coke molecule? If you don't have any coke to start with, yeah. I mean, it will lay down right on the solid. and. What I'm getting at is the, this is just an overlapping thing. If you have active site, not the whole surface active, so you have active site in here that you generate a coke molecule or coke and covering this molecule, and uh, I mean this site and this site. Now this part of the coke deposit in here, you are not killing, you are only killing this one active site, but your coke will spill over into the labor coke. So that's why you have not just coke covering the active site, coke also covering the coke. Dottie, um, Dottie Berger, West Virginia University. Uh, I thought maybe I would try to put, put some of these questions together. Uh, basically, we have uh, looked at a model yes. where you have two possibilities. One is where it sits on, a, on an empty, mm -hmm. uncoked site, and the other where it sits on a adjacent to a site that's coked. When you do that, you get a slightly more complicated model, but it's one that obviously will fit this as a limiting case, mm -hmm. and it also fits the other kinds of slopes yeah. as a limiting case. So depending upon that, you can do that. Yes. This works fine if you have that kind of a shape. Yes. Basically, what that means is that most of the coke is coming on top of the coke site, mm -hmm. or that the rate of the coke site is very much faster. Yeah, that's right. yeah, we call that the uh, autocatalytic uh, rate. And the, uh, and the non-catalyzed rate uh, is, is, is negligible. Yeah. But you can have it also the other way around, where it prefers to go. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's depending on what time period you're looking at. If you're looking at very short time period, okay, the first one will be mostly on active site. And then we, right now we are looking at, uh, what, 80 hour, 100, yeah, 80 hour out. So that we fit the whole curve. So the, the major contribution is coke on coke, you know, random distribution among active site and the coke site. Okay, thank you for that clarification, and thanks uh, again for a very fine talk. Thank you.